Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Lisa Jardine. Hello. When the English stock market crashed in 1720, Sir Isaac Newton, who lost £20,000, is supposed to have said, I can calculate the movement of the stars, but not the madness of men. Today, we regard science and mathematics as the key to economic recovery and a proper understanding of how the world works. Was Newton wrong? Or do we risk further calamities like the financial crash of 2008 if we allow mathematical models to decide how financial markets will behave? Should we be worried that companies can mine vast data sets to predict our future behaviour or follow our every move? To try to answer some of these questions, I'm joined by Kenneth Couquier, data editor of The Economist, who writes widely on technology, business and economics, James Wetherill, assistant professor of logic and the philosophy of science at the University of California, Irvine, Tiffany Jenkins, an independent sociologist and cultural commentator, and Marcus de Sotoy, professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford and an eloquent advocate for the power of numbers since his best-selling book, The Music of the Primes. Kenneth Kukia, let's start with you. In your new book, Big Data, the subtitle, one of those long subtitles that allow the search engines to creep over and find all the key terms, um, the subtitle is A Revolution That Will Transform How We Live, Work and Think. That's quite a big claim. Could you start us off by explaining what we mean by big data? Yeah, absolutely. So we've always had information around and for most of the time, we've had lots of data as well. But new technologies have allowed us, and new mindsets, have allowed us to do new things with it that we weren't able to do in the past. What we're finding is first, we are able to take more data about something that we've already been collecting in the past, but getting not just a lot more data, but vastly more data. Secondly, we're able to take things that had never, had always been informational in a way, but had never been rendered into data form. And we're now starting to put a datafied, quantified element to it. And when these things get married and we have the new technologies that allow us to parse this information really well, we can do some radically new things. Could you, okay, could we have a simple example of, no, if I say simple, that's not fair. Could we just have an example um, of, of how that works? And perhaps you could just say before you give it to us, what sort of orders of magnitude are we talking about, about the increase in data, just to give us some well, idea? Yeah, sure. I mean, one very basic way of thinking about it is that um, the Library of Alexandria, about 500 BC or so, uh, was known to contain all of the written heritage of the world. We now have about a couple hundred Library of Alexandrias for every single individual in the world. And that number is is growing at a preponderant rate. And it's actually increasing as well, the pace with which it increases. Roughly, the amount of information in the world doubles about every three or four years. Some statistics look in other directions, but that's the most conservative. And companies like Amazon can suck up all that data and... and combine it and then you've got a vast repository. Let's just look at Amazon as one short example right now. Books, people have always gone into bookstores, they've browsed and they've left. They may have looked at six books, they bought one. The bookstore, if they wanted to really match and know their customer, would look at the data on that one single person and learn something about their traits and who they were and what they might be interested in for other books. Amazon can look at not just what you purchased, but what you've only looked at and browsed. They know for how long. They know where you were when you did it at the time. They may know what page you were at before on the web and where you went afterwards. All that information are signals, if you mine it correctly, to give you a profile of the person and sell them more. Now, can you give us an example of that data mining which yields some interesting result? Yeah, sure. What we're finding is that we can reuse data in innovative ways. So one example is Google Flu Trends. Our interaction with Google is basically we put in a search term, we get a response, and it seems as a consumer that our interaction with the company is over. But Google collects all of this data and stores it forever. It's in an anonymized or quasi-anonymized form. Nevertheless, what they're able to do is go into the past searches, and what they did a few years ago was match searches of the, they get about a a few billion a day, with the correlation of where flu was in America on a regional basis. Now, often if you think you were to find out, if you were to use Google searches as a proxy for where flu is, we would have to think together in a room, what are the terms that would most likely correlate with this? That's not what Google did. What they did is they let the data speak for for itself. They just ran the correlation about a 
a list of about 500 million terms on a weekly basis through lots of mathematical models. Happen to be 450 million mathematical models. There you have it. What they were able to find is that they were able to correlate where, in a very strong correlation, where flu outbreaks were going to be at, in quasi real time. Because of what people were ordering, because they were ordering flu remedies ahead of time. Well, that's our innate human sense of causation. We want to presume that this is because they're looking for search terms, uh, uh, flu-related terms. And in truth, if you look at the terms, many of them are search-related terms. In the top 100, there was the term college basketball. And the reason why is it's played in the winter, and it, and it happens to correlate with the seasonal outbreak of the winter flu. However, the, but that was not, Google cut it off after 45 terms, so that was not part of their model. And the reason why is when they put in these other terms, although there was a strong correlation, it lessened the strength of the model. Now, you, you, you spoke there about uh, I'd done the classic human thing of looking for causality, looking for a, a reason why uh, what, what one of the terms that came up in that top 45 um, would correlate with flu. Um, Say a little bit more about the way in which this way you are proposing of mining data, uh, these these big data um, data sets, uh, is actually doing away with that idea of causality. Well, what we're able to do is when we have many, many variables, we have to give up a degree of understanding in terms of how the world works. We have to let the data speak for it itself. We like to see things ourselves as human beings, uh, why a drug may work, why it may not. But the fact is, reality is very, very complex. And we often mislead ourselves. That's one reason why we put drugs on the market and then we have to backpedal and take them off the market. When we trust the data and look at the data, it is a little bit less biased in some respect, not in all respects, but in some respect than we are. And therefore, it can find correlations that we simply as human beings can't because we have limited capacity. In a small data universe, the one we lived in up until very recently, we could sort of interact with the world and try to get highly curated data because we didn't have that much of the data. But now that the vast amount of data has expanded, we now have to give it to the machine to do what it does best, and that is parse through it to come up with insights. Now, inevitably, you're sounding pretty evangelical there, so I think I'm going to ask Tiffany, who I'm sure is much more sceptical about this, uh, perhaps to ask you about those, those wonderful correlations that we would never have noticed. Well, I do think the claims for big data are outlandish and probably wrong. Um, I think there's a number of assumptions at the heart of your book that I would want to question or certainly unpick. The first is that um, you can measure everything, that more is measurable. The second is that data is the same as knowledge. Now, you talked just now about the Library of Alexandria and compared it to the immense library now we have of our own selves. What's more important and what's more interesting? Well, probably the Library of Alexandria. More data doesn't mean more knowledge. But I think the central problem I have with your thesis is this idea of letting the data speak for itself. You mention that a lot in the book and you argue that data is predictive. I think what there is a danger of is a kind of data determinism a dataism. I think human beings have to interpret and analyse the data and if it's to have any application we do have to understand causality. Kenneth Kuki, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, uh, there's a few things there. L let me first go into uh, whether more uh, gives us everything. If we, we, we will never absolutely get all of the data. We, we never can, so that's really not the goal. Whether data gives us knowledge it, it can if we want it to. So let me give you an example. For years, captains have been in, in, on the high seas were writing their captain's log. They were looking at the winds and they were looking at the waves. But still, for most of time, people, mariners, felt that the winds and the waves were unpredictable and the oceans were a chaotic and difficult place where it was just random. What a fellow was able to do in the mid-1800s in America was to take all of the captain's logs going back about a century that he could get his hands on and extract the data from it temperature of the ocean at the time, the direction of the winds, the, the direction of the waves and the currents. And he was able to spot, if you will, the patterns of the sea that wasn't apparent to any singular person at any time. But when you aggregated all of this data, nature no longer looks so random. We could now rest it under human control. We could tame it by human hand, not entirely, but just enough so that we could have a safe passage. 
That is, if you will, an early precursor of big data. And that's simply what we're talking about, that we can extract meaningful insights. Not to, We don't know why the currents work in the way they do, but if you're trying to get from New York to Rio de Janeiro, and it's the mid-1800s, you'll probably have a safer voyage by listening to the data. The example you give, you put human control at the centre of it in terms of understanding and application. But I think in your book, you argue against human judgment and you point to the demise of expertise. Well, I, I don't see the two things different in the way I've just described it. And the reason why is in the past, there was always a salty dog who would tell you you needed to travel you know, completely to the east uh, to get to the south of the equator and then to, to jerk back right uh, to the west to get to Rio de Janeiro from New York. It happened to be a very difficult passage, mainly because uh, sailors would th throw themselves into the most asinine routes. What we found was a straight shot south was fine. But our human judgment was fallible. We didn't know that. It was based on sort of instinct and intuition or reading tea leaves. But when we just learned to listen to the data, we were able to come up with insights that were more valuable that saved lives. Marcus de Sotoy, I actually wonder if you could take us forward because we're, we're, we're going to be moving into another application of mathematics, maybe to sort out for us what I think is a distinction between um, the huge data sets and the, um, the sorts of um, uh, technology you have to use to, to mine them and the mathematicization, which I think Tiffany um, was having trouble with, uh, which sounds as if it's going to overwhelm all human activity, but in fact does something else. Well, I mean, I think uh, one has to come back to what pa mathematics is about, which is um, mathematics is really the search for pattern and structure and order and trying to navigate the world around us. It's how our brain evolved. I mean, we're all essentially mathematicians at heart because that's how we interpret the world around us and the more information you have uh, the more you're going to be able to, to, to make that analysis and I think at the moment it's about choosing your battles carefully I mean mm. if, if you take something like uh, Nate Silver's uh, predictions of the American uh, US election he seemed like some sort of magician but no all he said was uh, you know, everyone's taking these polls why not let put all the polls together you've, I mean basically what's an election it's just counting number of votes so if you've already got a huge number of votes you're going to get much more insight and so he, he called all, all all states correctly, but um, so I think it's uh, it's about which which things actually are you likely to win on. I mean, one of the things I think. Uh, if you take something like the Large Hadron Collider, huge amount of data there, but if you didn't know what you were looking for, and this is, I think, the role of the mathematician in big data, is to be able to, 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 to know where to look sometimes. How do you spot a pattern? And, and often, randomness can produce things which look like patterns which aren't real. I mean, a great example is um, the Bible code. I mean, there you've got a huge amount of data, the Bible, and you say, okay, are there messages hiding mm. inside here? If you do your statistics badly, you'll come up with correlations between, um, you know, uh, rabbis' deaths, uh, dates of death and their names in the Bible. But that's a, a false correlation. You can find the same in Moby Dick. So um, so I think, you know, it's, it's the, the idea of correlation is very powerful, but, it, you know, it's, there are examples where it's misleading. And could you, could you maybe just give, maybe this is too much to ask of you, but <laughs> maybe <laughs> you could, uh, uh, because I'm going to move forward to an application of mathematics to systems of human behaviour, um, uh, which um, is tried and tested as it were, um, just give us, I think it's hard for non-mathematicians to have any idea in their head about what it would mean to look for a correlation or to find a correlation or to devise an algorithm that, that, uh, that searched for these, uh, these relationships. And the reason I ask that um, is that there is a slight sense of pulling rabbits out of hats. And I think the reason that, um, uh, that Tiffany is nervous about... I'm putting words into your mouth. I'm really sorry, Tiffany. Um, uh, nervous about pulling out false correlations is because we don't really have a sense of how the controls are built into the systems. Well, I mean, yes, mathematics is about producing models, in a way, to try and understand um, what 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 might happen next. I mean, that's what we're quite, kind of all after. We're trying to predict the future from uh, looking at the past. And, of course, um, those models, I mean, the correlation that you might pick out might be um, not 
you might not have had enough insight into what or, or a situation, an outlier, which might send things in a completely different direction. So, so it's almost. I mean, actually, big data is nothing new. It's how we've done science for 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 centuries. I mean, we we look at um, the data, we try to to find some connection between it. We do the what, and then we try and do the why. I mean, I think uh, you know uh, the idea that we should throw away the why. No, the point is that um, let's do the what, and then try and understand the why, because it'll take us somewhere new. OK, that's a perfect moment, I think, for me to move on. Um, now, if you took a poll of the most untrustworthy occupations these days, it would be bankers and economists who were up there with politicians and journalists. But what do we think about physicists? Are the men in white coats above the hurly-burly? They're not of in Eka? white coats. Uh, that's a real... Uh, or, uh, OK, you're, uh, uh, that's a, uh, an it's image. A, that's yeah, almost, as much, that's oh, almost as much of a trope as the idea that Newton said what I said in my okay. intro. All right? <laughs> <laughs> that's the way we do it, OK? Are the men in white coats, or not in white coats, uh, and the women, <laughs> above the hurly-burly of economics and politics? Don't they spend their days deep underground in Switzerland searching for the meaning of the universe? Not according to James Wetherill and his book, The Physics of Finance, Predicting the Unpredictable, which celebrates the achievement of physicists, men of science, in the murky world of Wall Street. And James, you do this um, in, in, essentially historically mm -hmm. um, and taking us up um, to the crisis of 2008. So perhaps you could tell us a little about the history of the way these men not in white coats and some women got into uh, the... the um, got into the finance system. Well, sure. Uh, so, so what I uh, what I do in the book is is look at uh, a number of examples of people trained as physicists, trained as as mathematicians, um, who at some point in in their careers uh, decided to to try try the the, the tools of their trade uh, in a, an entirely new new domain uh, to to try to apply ideas, methods from physics, from mathematics. Uh, to understand financial markets and um, the the really quite r remarkable contributions that have come uh, from f far far flung far flung places from the point of view of at least of, of, of mainstream economists and some of the most important ideas behind uh, uh, modern financial practice really have come from physicists and mathematicians. Of course, not all of the ideas, but uh, a shocking number of them. And uh, and. As it were, physicists and math mathematicians actually go into the uh, stock market, into the and and uh, and they actually become. Um... Oh, that's right. So th there are uh, sort of two separate strands here. One is how uh, sort of a history of ideas. Uh, where what what are the debts that modern financial theory uh, owe to to physicists and to mathematicians? Um, but then also. Uh, how is it that you know? So, so one thing we heard an awful lot about in, in 2007 and 2008 uh, was the role of quants, so-called quants, these uh, highly mathematical traders and analysts who. Yeah, so, just who so people understand, because we get all these things that, yeah. that with names. these are actually people, quants. They're quants people are who... people. That's right. <laughs> uh, in fact, there are a number of things in my book that that turn out to be people that you might have not expected to be people. Um, computers. Uh, in one chapter, turn out to be people. Uh, the but, army at one stage of this enormous Okay, but let's stick with quants. Analysis. Now that we've got the hang of the fact that they are actual people yeah, applying right. these models in the financial sector. So, 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 so quants are, are people who uh, uh, have have backgrounds in physics and mathematics and engineering. Uh, increasingly, uh, MBAs can be quants as well. Um, but uh, we heard an awful lot in two thousand seven and two thousand eight about the role that they had played in the crisis. And uh, one thing that became clear was that there were an awful lot of them. There were an awful lot of people working at Wall Street banks who didn't have backgrounds uh, in, in economics or in banking. They had backgrounds in, in science. And so that's a separate, a separate thread from the history of ideas. I talk about both in the book, and they're related to one another, of course. But, uh, uh, and that fulfills a... Tiffany's worst fears, doesn't it? That, 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 the, that the men with the models got separated. Oh, we're men. Men and women with the models got separated from the... Um, the human, intensely human area that they were involved with. I think there's a real danger here of naturalising the economy and applying physics to the economy. And I think what you've done is conflate the financial markets, where you can make money with physics, with the economy, which is a social and political 
project. And that needs to be subject to human intervention. That is really about how we want to run our world, how we want to run the economy. That's something that is debated within society. And it's something that physicists can tell us very little about. And relying on them will certainly not get us out of this financial mess that we're in now. Kenneth Kukier. Yeah, Tiffany, would you, would you rather that we not use math to try to understand the economy? I think we can use it to understand the market and financial markets. But in terms of how we want to run our economy, not really, no. That's a social and political question. And if you think where we are today and why actually financial markets arose, it was really as a result of decline in production in the 1970s. That's where this all came from. What we really need to do is find a way to build growth. Physicists are not going to come up with that. Marcus de Sotoy. But there's a perfect example at the end of, uh, of the book, um, which is where um, the US government decide they want to set um, uh, inflation at a particular value in order to save themselves money. And so they go in and they try and create in this committee um, a formula... They, they sort of work backwards from the thing they want the answer to be. But actually that's going to cheat people out of um, the, the, the in, inflation rate is related to um, what your pension is going to be, uh, benefits and things like that. So uh, if you actually use a mathematical model, which was proposed by uh, Weinstein and Milani, uh, using mathematics, which gives you actually the, the truth of the situation of what um, uh, inflation will be, you actually cut through the, the human intervention of politics trying to actually sort of uh, engineer what they want the answer Marcus, you're a true mathematician. You just used the word truth about... Oh, yes, well, I'm into truth. Your Absolutely. Model. Oh, gosh, yeah. but James, yeah. James, I think we'll let well, James I, I just, come back. I just want, there are just two things I wanted to say here. One is that, uh, as a matter of fact, f- physicists have had an enormous contribution to just mainstream economics uh, over the last you know, 150 years or so. I mean, so... Uh, for instance, the first Nobel laureate in economics, Jan Tinbergen, uh, was trained as a physicist. Um, the second... Uh, Nobel laureate or winner of the second Nobel Prize in economics anyway uh, Paul Samuelson was his first book it was uh, he, he was a student of a student of the great American uh, mathematical physicist Willard Gibbs uh, and and he in his his first book uh, uh, started with a quote from Gibbs and you know talked throughout about his, the deep influence that that Gibbsian uh, thermodynamics had on his theories. And th- yeah. There's a long history but, here. But 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 James, uh, we, mainstream yeah, economics. We broke into that wasn't quite fair because we broke into your account. And I want you to talk a little bit about um, uh, where you arrive after in the, towards the end of your book, which is that that what went wrong in 2008 was not the physicists and their models, but that, but that those who were applying the models were not physicists enough. Could you say something about that? Well, there's actually a bit of an irony here, because I think that, that I agree far more with, uh, with Tiffany than, than maybe it, uh, it was seeming, because I, I, I do think that uh, what went wrong in 2007 and 2008, and in previous instances as well, 1987, for instance, the Black Monday crash, uh, had a lot more to do with the misapplication of models than with failures of the models themselves. There, there's, uh, it's very easy when you have a piece of mathematics to uh, allow yourself, I, I'm a big fan of the truth too, Marcus, but uh, to allow yourself to think that, it, that, that a, a piece of mathematics is the truth and nothing but the truth, the whole truth about whatever matter that you're, you're concerned about, that you, somehow you have a final theory that's telling you how markets work. No, I agree. And, I mean, and that's not right. Yeah, I mean, these uh, equations, like the Bax Coles equation, tells you what an option, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a model which says what an option, some, uh, something you can buy in the financial market should be worth, but it, it's only a model, and the models can be wrong, and the, uh, and the, the uh, the actual uh, sort of system can change such that the model was right. So it's a constant um, thing of updating the model, which is, of course, what we do in science. Right. And okay. in order to do that, you, you need to have some sort of understanding of, of how you think the model represents the world and how it can fail to okay. represent now, the world. Okay, now, who around the table wants to give a very quick um, account of how models now are somewhat self-correcting and um, how you can you can iterate in order to modify your model so that it is... I think well, it's I, probably James. Well, I, I don't think they're self-correcting at all. I mean, no, I... I no. uh, well, except I, I think Ken yeah, might yeah, say yeah, they were. Ken, they are. Ken, OK, well, let's, we'll let James yeah, start. We'll yeah, let James yeah. start, and then I want to have a word also, from Kenneth, because the big data man, I think, might dis- disagree there. Uh, well, so maybe, there, maybe there's a distinction to be made. I mean, there are different things that can, can uh, uh, count as, as models. Uh, and, but the, the kinds of things that I'm thinking about... Um, Really aren't self-correcting. They're they're uh, they're models that 
uh, are based on you know, strong simplifying assumptions and idealizations about how markets work. Uh, they're, they're great approximations in, in some regimes, but n not all the time. And we really do need, there really is an important place for the human element to, to interpret models, to interpret market conditions, and, and to make decisions about uh, when a model is appropriate to you. I can see Marcus nodding like crazy, and I know that's partly because he's trained some of these uh, people. <laughs> yes, yes, have... all, all my postdocs go off and leave uh, mathematics and go into uh, <laughs> making money. Tiffany, but, uh, just before I ask... I, can, I yes. just want to come back to something you said, Marcus, which was a dismissal of the American politicians. And I'm all for doing that. I think they made the wrong decisions, but they're the ones who have to make the decision about where to take the economy. They know better about what future they want for American society, and they are elected whereas mathematicians are not. Yes, We're but surely they can make a decision much better based on um, uh, as much information as possible and as much information which is going to actually uh, tell you uh, uh, how things are rather than how you want them to Those be. models aren't telling them how to create growth. But I, yeah, I'd avoiding. like to come back to that. Maybe we could come back to that in a few minutes about the who does it and what are the uh, some of the um, ethical and political implications. But if I, could, I really would like just a word from Kenneth because um, you know it seems to me that what I'm hearing from the, the 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 hard mathematical models in the financial sector is different from what you were saying. For instance, about the Google translation machine. Right. Okay. So uh, first, as a, as, a, as a quip to our conversation about models, a famous mathematician of the 20th century, George Box, said, all models are wrong, some are useful. Mm -hmm. right? So we're never going to have all of, the, um, of, uh, all of the data. Now, Google Translate, is very, uh, uh, Google Translate is very interesting. What we try to do for translation is try to understand what a word means in one language and another and teach a computer to think like a human being to figure out how that worked. But a shift took place because that wasn't really working very well. It's just hard to do because it's just so myriad. It's a big problem. So instead, what we did is we fed the computer lots of data. We looked at, in this case, uh, the Canadian parliamentary transcripts that are both in French and in English, and it was a real sea change. It became better because now it was just based on probability. It was statistical machine translation. It just looked at the frequency of one word in one language and whether what was the most likely word for the other. So, an example, in French, you'd have ligère, and should that be, um, or you'd have light in English, and should it be illumination or ligère, right? Weight or illumination. That was good, but it wasn't great. We only had a couple of million documents. But when Google got into the game a little bit later, they didn't have a million documents. They had trillions of documents. They used the entire global internet. They looked at every document from the EU in all 21 languages when it was translated that way. They looked at, in the Google Book Scanning Project, every translation of the book they translated. They looked at all the corporate websites that have very high-quality translations. Dealing with preponderantly more data, orders of magnitude more data, allowed us to give up the benefit of having highly curated, accurate data, and instead, with the messy data, get much better translations. And that was the sea change. It was a, pr a branch of artificial intelligence called machine learning. But if you really under want to understand what it is, it's just probability. It's just math. The computer doesn't have to understand language anymore. Yeah, but people, I think the, I think the phrase computer learning sits nicely alongside the other model that James and, and Marcus were, were sort of talking about. So I think that, that takes us to a reasonably good place, although I would have loved, I, maybe we'll have time for you to say a little bit more about messy data, which seems, but maybe. Um, so, um, but... Um, I'd like to move on and really ask a broader question, which is the question that's circulating around this table already, which is, are we living in an era where science and mathematics is going to be our guide for the answers to the big questions? Um, is it going to be science and mathematics that make the money and predict the future? And is that all that we want out of our knowledge gathering and uh, sifting and model building? Um, so I think, uh, Tiffany... Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I've been really struck in recent times by the use of, by politicians of things like evidence. The evidence shows, the evidence base for this is. And in my field where I research, I research the arts and how we value them, there's been a kind of creeping instrumental um, measurement discourse. So everybody wants to measure everything. So they're bringing in any kind of semblance of maths and science to these areas which previously wouldn't have been interested in them. And I think we have to ask why. I think what's happened is that kind of political questions, social questions and artistic questions have been kind of made feeble. They're in retreat, and that's why they've embraced this kind of idea, this appearance of certainty. But while science and maths can bring certainty to some areas, it can't to the more social and human areas, and that's where it's dangerous. So I, I don't necessarily blame science and maths. I think the geeks finally think that this is their time, and I don't blame them for that. <laughs> 
But the reason is is that they're being invited in, and they're being invited into areas where they really have no application. Now, I think that's a very, very interesting question. Of course, it takes us beyond. Yes, uh, Kenneth. Yeah, um, I agreed with all of it except for the very last thing you said, that they're invited into areas where they, quote-unquote, have no application. I think they have a great application. I agree that we should be on guard. However, I think that um, uh, the application is actually quite good as long as it's done in the right way uh, and not, and we don't divorce our judgment to the data, but that we marry the benefits of using the data with what our re- sensibility and reasonability tells us. I have a suspicion that one of the things that underlies uh, Tiffany's um, uh, remarks is that um, try applying for a humanities grant from a grant-giving body at the moment. Unless you can quantify what you're doing, you don't stand a hope. There are... Marcus de Soto. Well, I, I think that is a, a real big danger because science has become extremely sort of powerful. It, it's, uh, you know, a lot of governments are realising that that's going to be, uh, you know, the secret to boosting the economy and things. But I think that uh, as a scientist, I, I think we will lose um, uh, a lot if we don't... St- talk to the humanities and the arts um, uh, in a sort of uh, uh, as a a partnership. I mean, I'm doing a lot of projects at the moment. I'm doing a project at the um, Barbican uh, looking at one of the big questions of science, which is uh, what is consciousness? Um, And I think that the point is that uh, uh, we have certain ways of looking at things, but so does uh, an artist. I'm working with James Holden, who's a composer, also a mathematician by training, but... um, But it's great because an artist can ask me new questions about a subject like consciousness that I haven't ever thought about. We get very boxed in in the way we think about things. And so I think we we sort of uh, um, let the the humanities and the arts wither at science cost. There is a danger with the question of what is consciousness um, that you locate it solely in the brain. Whereas, well, I would do that. Actually. Yes, <laughs> that's why I'm saying. No, but I, that. Where would you put it? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a joint enterprise. Obviously, if you didn't have a brain, you wouldn't have consciousness. But at what point in humanity's development did we well, develop? Did, did, did I, we I, develop I, a sense? Well, I think this relates to big data. Of ourselves. Ourselves. I'm in the room. Okay, I feel like well, step in. Let, <laughs> let, let, let me referee here. Let me okay. referee yeah. here. Okay, so um, uh, there was a slightly condescending note, Marcus, that I worried about in your uh, in your contribution, where you kind of you let us back in as a kind of um, from Frosting and uh, cherry on the. No, on no. It, well, that was so. Oh. So I just, I just. I, I mean, what we are not addressing or haven't addressed yet, and maybe it, 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 it runs alongside. I think Tiffany Jenkins' strong um, sense that that the maths and 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 number is is drowning out a whole lot of crucial questions. There's a bit of triumphalism about um, uh, both of, of your books, James Weatherall and uh, Kenneth Cuvier. I mean. Uh, yours in particular, Kenneth, you know, it starts terrifically triumphalistly, if that's a word. Um, by the end, you are being more concessive. But could you perhaps say something about the limits that would feed into Tiffany Jenkins's sense that the, we, we want a dialogue here? Yeah, um, there is a, there's always been a temptation to lean on the data and let it make decisions for us because the world is a complex place and the data can help us this way. But done in the wrong way, uh, it's going to lead us down a lot of uh, terrible places. We have experience with that. Of course, the Vietnam War in America in some ways is the first war fought over a data point, a statistic, and that was the body count. Uh, McNamara was a professor of statistics at Harvard. Uh, he was part of an elite team at the Pentagon during World War II that helped win World War II by being able to data eyes and inventory all of America's armaments and save money. And, and of course, modern warfare became a, 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 about mobilizing resources and who did it more effectively would win. And uh, the success was f- phenomenal. He turned around Ford when he and the whole team went en masse to then America's most ailing company. By the time they got to the Pentagon, he had simply allowed the data and trusted the data to do things that it was never intended to mm. do. In this case, the the whole point of, of a war of attrition and using the, the data point of body count was atrocious and immoral and disgusting and wrong. Uh, and in fact, the data itself was wrong. So these two things compounded it that it, it was meaningless and America only learned this much, much later because no one had the common sense to figure that out. And I do fear that in a world of big data that we're going to multiply that problem many fold. In today's Metro newspaper, the headline is all about predictive policing, that an algorithm of Big Brother is going to look at, is going to identify future crimes and arrest people, perhaps, prior to those crimes being created. I mean, if you knew that the crime was likely there with statistical certainty, be odd if you weren't to intervene with an arrest of some sort. So whether it's an arrest or not, just the police using this technology should frighten us. So I think what we need to do is carve out a place for the human, for the sacred, for the 
for for man's will or human will to intervene in the data as a stopgap measure so that we can learn from it in responsible ways but we're not beholden to it that we don't slaughter our judgment on the altar of data okay i want I tiffany think, to come back there we're still i think adding we're, we've still got human humaneness is a bit of an add-on so yes you, you kind of bring it in at the end as a kind of spell check almost and i think it should be much <laughs> much earlier on and far more central i do think your points in the book about the authoritarian implications of this are very serious and should be taken on board likewise the implications for privacy mm. but I think what what it ends up doing is just being inherently conservative because you follow the data rather than shaping the future and that's why it's also a very big problem for yeah, politicians. Yeah I agree with that I mean I think that's the why uh, you, you've still got to ask that why question because that can take you somewhere new. Mark, I mean, I Mark think, Stasoto, the, why don't you say a little bit about how you're setting up what I take it is some sort of experiment in uh, music versus uh, let's say the, the, the brain map of the nematode worm or the brain map of the human brain. Yes well I think you know consciousness the question of consciousness is one that we really don't under Stand. And I think actually it's interesting that um, what we're looking for is something called the neural correlates of consciousness. So at the moment, we really don't want know what it is. It's such a mystery. So we, we start with Kenneth's kind of um, idea of, OK, we'll look for correlations. What do I need to take out uh, and still have consciousness? So you can remove the cerebellum at the back of the brain and, and still be conscious. Um, so that's a good start. And I think it sort of uh, illustrates the idea of big data. But uh, but eventually, you know, you might actually, uh, I mean, there's a project to, to actually make a sort of artificial brain. If you t say where all of the neurons are, all of the connections, the synapses, is, and, and you and the, the the sort of logic map between how those might fire and things. Would you actually have something which was conscious? Well, you, I, I, I'm not sure you would. I, I think mean, that's you said the answer would be no. Pro well, I know. I think the answer is we don't know. No, I mean I don't see why you're so you adamant testing? that it's okay. um, so it's uh, provisional. Uh, Tiffany and I Jenkins, that you're open. But I think if you look at the development of humanity, there are two factors that are really important in terms of the development of consciousness. One is language. At which point does language give us a self-awareness? Would we have it without it? Obviously, we wouldn't have language without the brain, but that's a kind of social communicative thing. Likewise, at different points in, society, at different points in history, you've had man more self-aware than others. And I think Harold Bloom makes the argument, and I think he's a bit overstated, that it is with Shakespeare you have the development of inner man. OK, so his, humanity and consciousness is historically constituted or at certain degrees of it is. So I think we have to see man as a social being as well as something that's just made in the head, made inside our brains. James Weatherall, let me I, mean, I want just to bring back in that theme. Of, so, so your physicists who are, you know, running the running the markets, I mean, uh, they they are in team. They are in tandem with economists who are soft scientists who do have a sense of behavioural psych, who do, who do include um, these other elements that are going to hopefully tether the models to the more humane side of... Is that wet of me to think that they might do that? Well, I, I, there are a few things to say. I mean, one is that uh, it's certainly the case that uh, details of, of how people actually make decisions of, uh, uh, are, are entirely relevant. I mean, m markets are, at the end of the day, a bunch of, uh, you know, people, yeah. you know, Great apes of <laughs> defaulting uh, yeah, yelling on, at default, one another, and right? Default, <laughs> defaulting on their mortgages. Yeah, right? that's right. And 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 you know, and and so, uh, in fact, uh, one of the the striking things that that uh, I discovered in the book was that the the very very earliest, uh, I guess actually the the second earliest uh, uh, physicist to 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 really come up with the idea that markets can be thought of as as a random process, which is absolutely essential to. Uh, much of modern financial theory, uh, based on on an assumption that he he took right out of psychology, um, uh, something called the the Weber Fechner law. Now, of course, it's it was that was obsolete psychology even in 1958 when he was working on it. But but the idea that that there's somehow a, a distinction to be made between the, uh, the 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 physics and the math and the details of of you know behavioral economics, I think, is a mistake. But actually, I, there's something else I want to say because I want to pick up on a, a line that that Marcus uh, started uh, regarding the role of models in policymaking and in regulation. One of the things that that I focus on at the end of the book is how uh, these models can be used as effective tools. I think uh, not in setting policy, but uh, uh, as a source of information for the people who have to make decisions about setting policy. And that, that seems to me to be extraordinarily important. If you want to make informed decisions, you should make them on the basis of all available information. That should include contributions from uh, uh, 
uh, as you say, Lisa, the, the soft sciences, although I think that if there were an economist in the room, she would probably object to that characterization. She'd probably <laughs> accept it alongside you mathematicizing. Whatever. Um, OK, now we've got, so we've, we've got, um, we've, we've got Kenneth self-correcting um, or machine learning uh, translation models. We've got Tiffany's um, Shakespearean language as being somehow um, un- unreached by the mathematical models. I want I want Ma- Marcus de Soto to bring us to draw us to a close by saying something because it's music that you actually um, uh, set side by side with the scientific and, ma- and mathematical models and tools. And could you does that help us at all? Because I think with language we tend to get lost personally um does it help us at all <laughs> god you've got god. two minutes uh, well, well, <laughs> my, my feeling it's about um choosing your battles carefully at the moment there are things that we can use mathematics to to really help us with um but you know maths is actually really easy it's it, it seems like cats which are really difficult i mean i don't understand a cat at all you know oh, what's going Marcus, on inside we're a supposed cat. to be understanding no, at the end no, of this no, and now point, we've got into no, cats. I, I think that's the point that you know the models at the moment are, are are you use them where they're effective and and sometimes but i don't think we should shy away from these big problems of what the hell is going on inside a cat so head. so in in a in really if I may be presume to round off what we've been saying, um, we're all excited. I think I'm I'm quite excited by these big data possibilities. Um, I'm quite excited at the idea we might get a few more physicists into the financial houses, so they might know what to do with well, their I'd models next. In physics, but, um... oh, well, I know, but they, there's no money in physics, is so. there? Um, uh, and <laughs> and and it's important, physics, and it's very right important. Part. Tiffany's Tiffany's um, uh, caveat. So we've got all of that excitement, and then we've got the the huge world in which this is not all that is going to help us to an understanding of the world and in a way it's been three to one and that's been extremely unfair but it's probably as Tiffany has told us the way that the world is going that is uh, for every three spokespeople we will get telling us that it is all to do with quantification and models uh, there will be only one of us allowed to come in and say but what about the heart the soul <laughs> is that um, uh, I hope that that is uh, um, fair enough so um, I think I think it just remains for me to uh, thank all my spirited guests. Tiffany Jenkins, who would have loved to have come in at the end there, and I didn't let her. Her next book, Keeping Their Marbles, will be out in the autumn. Marcus de Sotoy, who's wonderfully presented his own billing of his lecture, a performance lecture on consciousness at the Barbican Centre on the 2nd of March. I've already booked. Um, Kenneth Kukier's Big Data will be published next month. And James Owen Weatherall's The Physics of Finance, Predicting the Unpredictable, Can Science Beat the Market, is out now. Next week, Tom Sutcliffe talks persecution with James Lasden, Mary Beard, John Gray and Roxana Silbert. But for now, from all of us around this table, we're now going to go away and have a good further conversation about it, I have no doubt. Thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free.